Welcome back. I'm hoping you had a great opportunity to engage with our sponsors during the community time. Um, I got to spend a few minutes having a chat with the Boehringer, Ingelheim and Lilly Alliance, talking about how things have changed and how they have been continuing their activity during this pandemic. If you didn't get a chance to them before, go and have a chat with them tomorrow during the community session. Book you one-to-one -one or have a chat over the, the internet. Um, I also got to go to the Gluco stand. It's a new name to me, but this is a, a group who've brought together the Academy. Now, the Academy is this online educational platform that healthcare professionals allows us to increase our knowledge of the technologies. Remember, technologies are moving such a rapid pace, it's very difficult to keep on top of it all. And this is something that's been put together between Gluco with ABCD and the Diabetes Technology Network in order to make sure that we are all up to date. If you didn't get to have a chance with them today, they'll be there tomorrow. There's plenty of opportunities and they're going to be giving live demos of the new educational program in the diabetes technology for us, the healthcare providers. We have a session just coming up now. It's going to be starting in just a minute. That's going to be looking at the impact on pharmacist-led cardiometabolic diabetes service. We're looking at managing diabetes in a resource-poor environment. We're going to be talking about the challenges and the opportunities that present integrated care for diabetes, and then the emotional and psychological well-being for people living with diabetes. Enjoy your afternoon. If you've got nothing else to do, use the time to catch up with the sessions that you may have missed. Alternatively, try and get the kids off the Netflix long enough to engage with you. Otherwise, I look forward to seeing you this evening at 6.30. Hello. I'm Professor Pratik Chowdhury, and I'm the chair of the Diabetes Technology Network in the UK. I'm really pleased to announce the launch of the Academy programme that we put together in conjunction with Gluco. Now, the need for this was because of the widespread increase in the use of technology, particularly for people living with type 1 diabetes. And we've all experienced over the last six months with the COVID pandemic, the value of remote monitoring, of the use of uh, Libre and LibreView and, and Clarity and all those uh, technology aspects that have helped us support people living with diabetes during this period. And actually, during that rollout of um, Freestyle Libre and with the imminent rollout of CGM and pregnancy, what we've realized is that there's a, a huge variation in people's comfort levels with the use of technology, people's expertise in the use of technology and, and how they roll that out. In fact, uh, and that's kind of what led to this project when um, Partha Carr, the National Speciality Director, uh, for diabetes came to us as the Diabetes Technology Network and asked us to come up with a program that would help um, allow people to gain access to education and learn from the experts, people like myself and Emma Wilmart and Alistair Lum who, who are embedded in technology and spend most of our time doing this. We know that a large number of colleagues out there, whether they're in primary care or even specialist care consultants, have so many other things to do, general medicine, endocrinology, that they are completely embedded in the world of diabetes technology. And we need a forum where people can, can get to terms with, with this and, and learn from learn about the use of technology. We know industry colleagues have got lots of places where you can learn about the button pressing and the technical aspects of technology, but actually in how we use them, what's the best way of, of getting the best value for this technology for the people living with diabetes. And um, we wanted a place where we could pull that together. And that's why Diabetes Technology Network teamed up with, with Gluco to create this academy project. Um, and what we've done is we've, we've addressed key areas of technology that people uh, touch base with through the, maybe the journey of someone with type 1 diabetes. We've got a module on interpreting uh, finger prick data. You know, we all know the value of, of those consultations, not done from memory of glucose readings, but actual numbers using a download from whichever system you want to use. So we've got, we've got um, SMBG therapies. We now are doing so many virtual consults. We've got a, a module, a section on, on tips that we've learned from about how we address um, virtual consults, what things to remember, how the language we use in consultations with language matters being such an important uh, aspect of, of care with type 1 diabetes. 
and then moving on. Uh, many of you will have seen the flash glucose monitoring education um, videos that we put out for people living with diabetes. We've now got an, the educational component of that put onto the academy project. Similarly, we've got CGM, and we've now with the imminent rollout of CGM in pregnancy, we've got a specific set of modules for CGM in pregnancy. So, and that I think is really important because with that pregnancy rollout, we're gonna have midwives and people in the maternity services who will never have had experience of diabetes technology who need to be familiar, aware of how these technologies work, what the do's and don'ts are. So the person with diabetes feels comfortable that the people looking after them understand the technology they're using. We've also got a module on insulin pump therapy. And again, with potential rollout of closed loop or access to closed loop over the next few years, we've got modules on sensor augmented pump and closed loop coming out. Now, what was really important here was that we used the glucodiacin platform because we know that 95% of hospitals in the UK have access to that platform. But even if you don't, access into this education program is completely free of charge. The other important thing is that although we have sponsorship of industry colleagues, all of the content in these modules is completely created by the Diabetes Technology Network without any editorial control from industry colleagues. So our hope is that you will log on, create your account and work your way through those educational modules, allowing you to get CPD in diabetes technology, allowing you to use that certification in your appraisals, allowing making sure that you are familiar, aware of best practice around use of those technologies. And what's really important is the full form of those educational videos will still be available on the DTN website. And what was really important to us creating this um, platform, creating this educational program for, for the healthcare professionals was that we had the same education out for people living with diabetes so that people with diabetes and their healthcare professionals are speaking the same language, working together to achieve better diabetes control. Thank you. Davey's top tip number seven. Nobody likes to talk to a blank screen. So edit your profile. Let us know who we're talking to. Hit the home button, that little house right in the center, and then on the left of your screen will be your profile. Edit it, upload a picture, put a bit about your biography, your skills, where you work, who you work for. Share your phone number if you're happy to do it. It's always nice to see a face rather than a blank screen. Hi, my name is Sabi Chowdhury. Uh, I'm the CEO of a company called Afon Technology, and I'd like to take the opportunity to talk to you today about the future of non-invasive blood, blood glucose monitoring. I'd like to start with a, with this interesting NHS statistics that were presented by Stedman, Lunt and Davis. Um, it's a staggering statistic in the sense that over five and a half billion pounds are spent by the NHS on addressing diabetes. Similarly, across the pond, um, in fact, a bit more, over 300 billion are spent on treating diabetes. But more importantly, in the UK, um, <laughs> over 3 billion is spent on avoidable treatment associated with, with, with diabetes. And this really arises for poor control of blood sugar levels. Um, and and, and leading to secondary complications and, and, and so forth. So hospitals tend to spend more on treating diabetics than they would do on, 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 on normal people, uh, on, sorry, on people without diabetes. And having attended um, DPC previously, the message that was being hammered by some of the key opinion leaders at that time was to actually empower people with diabetes to, to, uh, to, to um, uh, you know, uh, better self-manage. And the only way to do that is by providing them with technology and capabilities and the tools to, in, uh, to be able to, to do that. So here, I'm, I'd like to share with you our journey in developing a tool that will inevitably help uh, people suffering with diabetes, not only in the UK, but across the globe as well. But first, also, I'd like to start with... Um, a book that was written many years ago um, by John Smith, 
the pursuit of non-invasive glucose, uh, hunting the deceit with turkey. And it reflects the, the, the field of non-invasive blood glucose management because every time you, you feel that there's a company that's just about to, to get there, their, their hopes are dashed and they, 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 they uh, disappear because their technology hasn't worked for, for whatever reason or so. So, and, and the landscape is literally littered by a number of companies that have actually gone down this route, tried to develop non-invasive blood glucose solutions and have failed. And the first company that really started all of this was GlucoWatch. Uh, I think it was back in 2006 where they uh, developed a, um, uh, a, a, a non-invasive type of uh, blood glucose watch using microneedles to suck up interstitial fluid. And again, they had some certain problems with that. That technology was then uh, taken over by a company called Solianis. Um, they had a, a pretty good attempt at it. They used electrophoresis to suck up the interstitial fluid, but again, all to no avail, and that company folded a, a few few years back. So it's been quite a, a challenging technology to 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 develop. But you've got certain companies, um, you know, people are still having a go at trying to develop non-invasive blood glucose solutions, and they tend to fall into three different categories. You've got the photonic systems, which use um, uh, lasers and, and, and light solutions, Raman spectroscopy type of systems to interrogate the blood in that manner. Then you've got companies looking at sweat detection. And again, you've got the electrophoresis type of companies again. Um, so th these are three of the, 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 the main ones. There is another um, um, a category here, which is the RF and microwave uh, category. And that's really where we fall. But when you look at the, the main thrust, I mean, a lot of the companies are actually looking at electrophoresis. You've got the, new, the Numura sugar beet solution that's actually extracting interstitial fluid in a non-invasive way. Um, and then you've got Novia Science, which have a, a sensor that's placed underneath the eyelid. And that transmits to a, a handheld system, which actually um, gives you your blood glucose reading. Integrity application have been around for some time. They use three different techniques. They, uh, they measure using three different technologies and then they have an algorithm, a weighted algorithm that actually gives them the blood glucose read, uh, value based on those, uh, on, on the weighting of, the, of those, on, on those models. And so these are some of the people that are looking at the, the um, uh, non-invasive uh, uh, space. But as it stands, what we have is we've got, got the good old faithful, faithful uh, finger stick devices that everyone tends to use. But you've also got the likes of Medtronic, Dexcom and Abbott that are coming up with their minimally invasive technologies. And this is a, 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 a huge leap forward in, in towards a non-invasive uh, solution. Although these are uh, minimally invasive devices whereby when you put the uh, sensor on your arm or in your stomach or in other parts of the body, it, a, a small micro needle is pushed into under your skin, and it extracts interstitial fluid, and that's what's used to give you your blood blood glucose level. Now, this is a, a great step forward in the in the you know towards that uh, holy grail of non-invasive blood glucose monitoring. But these systems do have their issues. They have issues related to sensitivity, the accuracy, and also the issues related to um, uh, allergies due to the, the, the adhesives that are used for, for, for uh, you know, uh, with, with, with the, uh, uh, um, the glues that they use to stick the sensor onto the body. And also there's, there's some people have experienced various types of infection with, 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 these, uh, with these devices. So moving on to, to our, our technology, well, we're, we're based, we're using RF and microwave technology in order to be able to develop, uh, in order to measure the blood glucose. And where it all started was back in a university up in North Wales, uh, back in 2005, where we sat down looking at blood um, by putting two uh, great big microwave sensors on either side of this plastic test cell that had blood with different um, uh, blood glucose concentrations in it. So every time I changed the blood glucose concentration, what I saw was a very, very subtle shift in the microwave spectrum. And that's really where I, I got started with, with, with this technology. Uh, the sensors I was using at that time were great big uh, antennas that were typically 
uh, more aligned to picking up satellite signals than actually measuring blood glucose of, of the uh, of the human body. So anyway, that was where, where I originally started. And uh, I went out trying to raise money to, in order to actually take this uh, concept further, more towards a, you know, in order to develop a, a commercial unit that could benefit diabetics across the across the globe. So back in 2012, I managed to get my first round of seed investment, uh, which allowed me to actually do a, a clinical trial up in the Royal Liverpool Hospital um, under under the uh, supervision of uh, Professor Tony Fisher there. And what it allowed me to do was to take he 10 healthy volunteers, take their blood, split it into three, four different separate vials, and then spike each individual with, with a different blood glucose concentration. And this, with, 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 with this step, I could then actually uh, uh, demonstrate that we could actually see these frequency shifts due to the uh, various uh, blood glucose glucose concentration so that was very successful it was a stepping stone that led to a further amount of seed funding back in 2014 which allowed me to to, to develop the technology a little bit further but it wasn't until three days before christmas on 2015 where i actually got some serious series a funding and um, that was a godsend because it allowed me to rather than operating as a one-man band it allowed me to um, pull a team together, pull a team of engineers, a team of regulatory people, uh, it allowed me to buy equipment rather than begging and borrowing it off various companies and effectively try and do this uh, very seriously. So so that's really where I originally started and effectively that's where our journey started. So we've got the money, we've got a lab and we're in, we've got the people to actually uh, start developing this technology. and. We built a bench steps, uh, a bench top setup, and it works really well. But then you decide to, in order to commercialize the device, you've got to actually put the device on a human body. And that's where the problems start, because you're now moving from a, a known environment where everything else fits to a very, very complex biological structure. So you've got to accommodate things like movement, uh, variations in the ambient temperature, uh, changing uh, physiological con conditions, skin temperature, the signal noise, um, uh, signal noise, and also different parts of the body. So, where about do you actually uh, stick this uh, this technology of yours? So, our approach uh, has been very different in the sense that we actually took a step back when we were addressing this problem. We said, okay, our ultimate goal has to be a blood glucose monitor, but we're going to do something very different. Our first device is not going to be a monitor, but more so going to be an indicator. And let me explain by that. What we're going to do is we're developing uh, a device that will give the, 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 uh, um, uh, the diabetic um, the information that tells them what their blood glucose is doing, rather than absolute value of the blood glucose. So it will tell them by, um, um, defined values of the blood glucose range, whether they're in the normal range, whether they've gone hyper or going hyperglycemic, or whether they're going hyperglycemic. And we will tell them um, by way of uh, an, an indicator, a, a, a green screen or an amber or red screen, but with an arrow that shows them the trend in which the blood glucose is actually moving. So rather than giving them the absolute value, we will give them an indication of what their blood glucose is, is doing. And this it's quite interesting because we've actually gone out, we've spoken to diabetics, we've spoken to um, uh, uh, physicians, we've uh, we've talked to carers about this and said, is this a, a good way forward? And it's it, from everyone that we've spoken to, we've got a, a, a very, very, unanim we've got a unanimous uh, agreement with the way that we're actually trying to approach this technique. Because at the moment, there's a new metric in town, and that metric is time and range. How long has your blood glucose been in the normal range? Because that allows the physician to actually tailor the, 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 the medication appropriately in a more accurate manner, rather than the, the old convention HbA1c type of, of, of measurements that people have been, have been used to. So that's really where we were when we decided to go along this journey and this is going to be our first release product as an indicator as an indicator device okay so when we first started we originally thought about using the earlobe as a as a way of 
measuring the blood glucose. So the idea was that we had a sensor stuck on the earlobe, tethered to a handheld unit, uh, which could then give you your, your blood glucose reading. And we started off, if you look on the left-hand side, with a very rudimentary contraption that resembles a clothes bag with our antenna sitting in, 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 inside it. And what we found with this device is as a person moved their head, there were variations in movement that uh, totally uh, disrupted the, the signal integrity. So then we moved to the uh, system configuration as shown in the, in, the, in the middle picture. We had a, 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 a headset that had the, um, uh, the sensor, the, the, the earlobe, on, on the earlobe, we controlled the, the, the pressure applied onto the earlobe with, with this configuration. Um, and then from that, we moved on to a uh, slightly less bulkier device that you can see on the right hand side, which is very, very small. It's about two centimeters by one centimeter that had the electronics built into it. And But that device was then actually stuck onto the earlobe using double-sided bio, biomedical grade uh, uh, adhesive uh, or, or tape as, as such. And that would transmit the signal to a detection unit, which would then uh, give you, uh, tell you what the blood glucose is, is doing. But the problems with this device were that we, we managed to, uh, or we were getting, um, we were compressing the, the, the blood out of the capillaries, out of the earlobe. So that was having a, a secondary effect on our, uh, on our measurements. So we had to rethink this problem. And what we actually had, had to do is we had to rethink um, the problem in the sense of the sensor and also the location where we wanted to put the, the, the sensor. So we moved away from the earlobe and decided to move to the, the wrist as a, as, a, as a different location. And the rationale behind that was, well, okay, people wear watches, so wouldn't it be great if we integrated the, the sensor within the watch, which would mean that you don't have to have a separate unit stuck on different part of your body or, or so, so it'd be integrated within the, the, the watch itself. And every, you know, a lot of people tend to wear uh, watches, so they're quite used to it, and it's, it's not uh, intrusive or, or disruptive in any way. But that meant that we actually then had to redesign the sensor itself. And the top figure on, on, on the right-hand side actually shows you a computer generation of what the sensor looks like. It's, it's a one-inch square uh, PCB with, with the actual ring sensor based on that. And it generates multiple resonances, which we then detect and, uh, and uh, work out what the blood glucose is doing from, from, from those. So moving from, a, um, from the earlobe to, to, to the wrist, has certain advantages. It has an advantage that, you know, okay, now it becomes a wearable technology because people are wearing wristwatches and it's more in line in tune with, with existing uh, wearable wearable devices. And because you've got smartwatches, they have a lot of the electronics that we would need with our sensor anyway. So you can offboard the electronics onto that. You can reduce the battery life and, 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 and so forth. So that was some of the, the, the other advantages or rationale in order to go to a wristwatch-based device. But then there's challenges, there's problems. They haven't gone away. They're there now. And specific things like shock and vibration. So every time you move your, 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 your wrist or your fingers, your tendons move, and obviously that has an impact on, on, um, on, on, on the signal. So we've got to be very clever, and we've had to develop various algorithms in order to get rid of all of those um, variations in, in shock and, and, and vibration. And we've also had to start looking at various types of electronics that allow us to be agnostic to whether it's, uh, 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 you know, agnostic to the type of uh, watch that we're, we're actually using. Is it running on an on a Apple iOS system or is it an Android, uh, Android watch and so forth? And again, then the other thing is that EMC compliance, you know, are we interfering with the signal on the watches? Are we um, uh, uh, radiating so much that we're actually cooking the, 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 the subject? Or not? So these are some of the, 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 the nuances that we'd actually had to deal with in order to try and develop a, 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 a non-invasive blood glucose uh, sensor that's uh, practical for real life uh, daily use. So, the the bottom right hand uh, picture shows the actual uh, PCB with a with a PTFE layer on top of it, and the blue um, unit on the side is the actual uh, plastic enclosure that holds it in place on the wrist. So once we developed it, we then wanted to test it in uh, in, in a real life scenario by testing it on 
on uh, uh, people with diabetes. So what we then did is we ran a couple of uh, clinical trials over in, um, in Germany at a place called Profil. Now Profil is a, uh, uh, is a diabetes clinic. It's typically the go-to house for anything to do with uh, testing insulins, devices, and so forth relating to, to diabetes. And we ran two trials. The first trial we ran was in 2018, was with the first uh, iteration of our, of, of our sensor. And then we ran a, a more recent trial back in the tail end of 2019 last year, where we uh, tested 16 uh, uh, volunteers with, with, with this technology. And it's a, it's a clamp trial, it's a 10 hour clamp trial, whereby um, we used uh, seven different levels of blood glucose uh, we were held the volunteer at those different glucose levels, and we took the blood. Uh, we, we we took a blood draw every five minutes, and we corroborated the blood glucose with using a, a gold standard, which is a super GL glucose glucose analyzer. So the setup here is typically what we had in 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 the clinic environment. Uh, the VNA is our is our machine that basically sends a signal into the sensor. It uh, sends a microwave signal, then it looks at the reflected signal, and from the reflected signal, we can then uh, work out what the what the individual's blood glucose is doing. On the left hand side, you see the the Clampart machine. The Clampart is a proprietary machine, closed loop machine developed by Profil themselves. It injects um, um, it injects glucose and insulin uh, to ensure. The, it, it, as a way to actually hold the blood glucose level at a certain uh, at a certain uh, uh, level, hence it's called a clamp machine because it clamps the blood glucose for a fixed period of time. So we, as I said, we had seven different clamp levels that we went through, and it depended, and we and we had different profiles of the clamp depending on what the volunteer came in in the, in the morning. So if they came in high we would generally start off at the higher levels and then take them gradually to the lower level before bringing them back up to the normal condition before we, we end the, uh, the, the trial. Okay, so what we did with the volunteers is we, we brought them in on two occasions. So the first day we, we brought them in, we um, connected them to the, the clamp art machine, we ran the trial for 10 hours, and then after the 10 hour period, they were um, they were obviously given food because they'd been fasting throughout the whole day, um, and then they were sent home. They, the uh, volunteers were then invited back three four days later to repeat the whole process again with with, with this. So, what we then do is we take the data and we build a model based on that data. And the, and the first thing that we do with, 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 the, with, with the model is we actually inject the data that we built the model with back into the model to make sure that it's actually working. And once we establish that, then what we do is we take the, the second day's data and inject it into the model using that we built from the first day's data to to uh, predict what the blood glucose is doing. And because of the sensor is taken off the volunteer, they're sent home and then they, the sensor is put on on the second occasion, it allows us to actually use the second day's data to predict the first day, uh, predict the, 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 the first visit data. And this is a typical one that shows exactly that. The blue line on here is the actual blood glucose as measured by the super GL every five minute intervals. The orange line that you see on here is the um, the first day's data predicted by the model that we built on, on, on the second day. So we're using the model that we built on the second day. Uh, we're feeding the, the data from the first day into that model and that's the uh, the correlation that we're getting. So when we put it on a on a, uh, a surveillance error grid, as shown on on, on the left hand side, we, we're pretty much in, in in the green region for for this individual. And the mod value that we're getting with this particular individual was about twelve percent. So when we put all the data onto it. Um, you see, you know, there's quite a large cluster. We, there's a lot in the green regions. There's, a, you know, it's spilling over into the into the yellow region. But interestingly enough, we don't have any in in the severe lower, severe upper, or the extreme region. So, ninety percent, five percent of the data is within the first two, first sorry, first three risk categories. So that gives us a a, a great degree of confidence that you know uh, we we've got something here that we can actually start now 
uh, we can start to look at commercializing. Okay. So just to let me give you a little bit more on, on, on the sort of mod values that we got. So although I showed you, um, so, so on the first day, on the first trial back in 2018, the mod values average that we were getting were around the 34%. So that meant that we had to go back and we had to tweak the, the, the sensor design. And, and then the, the trial that we did last year, the mod values that we got at that point were in the region, the average were about 21.3. We did get some you know 25 26 percent but we also got some uh values that were as you saw the 12 we had some 15 16s around those regions and when we look at that data and we put it and compare it with um with uh, what uh, people have, have got with uh, the abbott devices and medtronic and the dexcom we're not too bad um especially when we look at the medtronic device 21.4 percent and we're getting 21.3 um, you know, for a non-invasive technology, I don't think we're, we're, we're too bad. And it's, uh, it's something that's got us really, really excited. But now we still have the problem. We've got to move this more from a, from a, a, a bench type of setup, whereas we've got this um, test equipment connected to the sensor, to a totally standalone sensor on its, on its own, um, more towards a more practicable uh, uh, solution that we would actually be available to you know to, to the di diabetic community. So in order to do that, we've uh, we've started looking at ways of how do we do this. And this is a uh, a, a rendered image of our our first engineering device, a standalone engineering device. And what you see here is you you see the the, the sensor in the in, in the middle. Uh, the enclosure is basically just so that it can actually facilitate the, the printed circuit board in here. And here you see the actual uh, physical realization of not only the, the enclosure, but also the, the printed circuit board with the sensor on there. Now, this current configuration is about 50 uh, millimeters by 50 millimeters PCB. And the, the size uh, is that big intentionally. We've intentionally exploded the, the the printed circuit board out uh, so that we can actually interrogate the chipsets on the on the printed circuit board while it's actually working we can check the tracks make sure that everything is is okay we're using multi-layered boards with this so these are quite complicated boards so the electronics is on the back side of that uh, of, of of that board on the underside this is a sensor which actually makes contact with with the skin as you can see, it, there's a little bit of curvature in there. That ensures that we've got a perfect fit with the uh, with the wrist as 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 such. And the bottom image actually showing shows you the um, the the device actually uh, attached to to the wrist it, it's it, itself. So where we are with this with this technology, we've done all the in-house testing of the different components on on the board. They've all gone through various temperature cycling, as as you would do with any engineering um, uh, procedure for in the development of any engineering and any uh, electronic-based device. And we have or we are developing the Bluetooth connectivity, and by the end of this month, we should have that up and up and ready, so that it is a totally standalone unit totally detached from the VNA that I showed you in, in, in the previous uh, picture. And what will happen is this will be interrogating the, the, the wrist every um, uh, 20 to 40 seconds. The data will be stored and then burst out to, uh, to the PC, uh, to the engineering PC, so that our engineers can then actually then uh, look at the data and analyze the data that we're getting. So we are planning on running some clinical trials uh, in the early part of next year, or you know, um, albeit COVID permitting, we've had a various setbacks because we've tried to get into various NHS trust sites uh, this year, but we just it's just not been possible because of uh, of the pand of the of the pandemic. But anyway, that's the the route where we're going with this with this device. So once we have this particular device and we've got the the data with this particular unit. 
the next progression is to actually miniaturize this device into something that's more practicable. And we are looking, in fact, we've actually designed the, the printed circuit boards and des designed some of the, the, the system uh, to be the size of two two-pound coins stacked on, on top of each other. So this shows you the actual um, end product that we will be developing or, or will be go going to market with. Our intention is to actually have this product in early part of 2022, uh, CE Mark product. So we are looking to start the um, development of, of this uh, smaller compact integrated solution at the, at the end of Q1 next year once we've got all the um, the testing out of the way for, for, for the uh, device as I showed you in, in, in the previous uh, slide. So the other one of the other features with these with this with our solution it is not only is it non-invasive, but there's no real time lag with this. So you are actually measuring the blood glucose as you know um, as, as it says at, at that particular moment in time. You don't have the 10, 15 minute lag that you do with the interstitial devices. And the rationale behind that is because we're actually interrogating the blood glucose rather than the blood glucose, rather than the glucose in the interstitial fluid it's, itself. So with the Bluetooth connectivity with this device, uh, you will get all the alarms, the alerts, um, and various things, you know, all, all the different parameters. It'll be able to um, uh, showcase or, or show the historic um, blood glucose trends that you're having. It'll, it'll show you whether you've been in the normal normal range for, how, you know, over the last three months or, 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 or so. Um, so all, all the classical things that you get with the other existing um, uh, monitoring, continuous glucose monitoring systems, all the user functionalities, except for the actual value of the blood glucose, will be available with this, with this device. And we're developing it such that it's agnostic to the operating system. It'll be compatible with the with, uh, um, iPhone, uh, sorry, the, the, the Apple Watches or with Android-based uh, based watches with this. So that's really where we are with this technology. We're very excited about it. Uh, we've got some very, very good results. Uh, we have had a number of challenges that we've had to deal with. Um, we've slowly and systematically overcome those, not only with the hardware, but also using clever um, signal processing techniques uh, that we've uh, applied to these um, uh, to these sensors. One of the things is that um, the team that I have are multidisciplinary. They come from various different uh, walks of life. They come from different uh, sectors, the telecommunication sectors. They come from um, uh, electric vehicle sectors, you know, various different parts of, uh, of, of, of technology sectors. And they bring with them lots of expertise, which we've been able to use to try and come up with a solution that we believe will be a game changer within the next uh, couple of years. So thank you very much everyone for taking the time to listen to my talk and uh, I'll take any questions um, that you may have now.